welcome to the latest PTD Club members session. Uh, every Wednesday at two, we bring our professional audience uh, the latest information from different jurisdictions, asset classes and ideas. Today, we're going to be speaking on Scottish real estate. Um, we've got an expert panel lined up that is going to guide us through uh, a discussion focusing on uh, asset management, tax, legal, uh, wealth structuring considerations. So we've got a lot to get into and uh, we're looking forward to a terrific discussion. Uh, we're joined on Zoom by uh, some PCD members and the broader audience uh, on YouTube. So welcome uh, to, to, our, uh, to our, our members with us on Zoom and our audience on YouTube. Uh, for the last 10 minutes, we will be networking with our, our PCD members um, on Zoom. So uh, we'll say goodbye to our YouTube audience at that point, but I hope you enjoy uh, the discussion until then. So um, today we're gonna to be focusing on the residential uh, aspect of Scottish real estate. I'm delighted to welcome uh, our panel and, and starting with uh, Charles Innes from Glenham Property Management. A uh, Good afternoon, Charlie. Good afternoon, David. How are you? Very well. So just to open up this discussion, uh, to set the tone, perhaps you could give us an overview of, of the Scottish residential property market and some of the key trends that we've been observing uh, in recent months. Um, yeah, so uh, in very general terms, initially, the, uh, the wider picture in Scotland has been one of resilience. Um, the market has performed strongly in the face of COVID and the headwinds associated with that. Um, rents in Scotland have proven to be resilient and in fact have increased over the, over the period of time that the pandemic has been around. Uh, demand for rental property has remained strong um, and in fact is likely potentially to increase as we do tend to see uh, an increase in demand as, as we enter into a period of uncertainty because people prefer to rent in those kind of times because it gives them a greater degree of flexibility to move where the work is and so on. Um, it's also probably worth touching it that, uh, in Scotland in terms of the legal element of renting. It is different to the rest of the UK. In Scotland, we operate with what is known as a private residential tenancy. Um, it is essentially an open-ended lease. There is no fixed term. Uh, and a tenant is given a greater degree of security of tenure that actually we have found has actually worked quite well. There was a lot of negativity around this in the landlord facing press in Scotland when it first came out. But I think tenants like it. Uh, and we find that tenants stay in properties for longer than they would have done. And it does give them a, a, a greater flexibility to move around and, and, and you know, work within the private rented sector. Um, there is a level of regional, regionalization that's been created off the back of the pandemic. Um, primarily, we're seeing this in Edinburgh. Um, Edinburgh as a city has always been an enormously popular place to live and tenants are attracted to it. It's a very wealthy city. But it also had a high percentage of short-term rental stock, the Airbnb model, um, that obviously when COVID hit, uh, the incomes from this dropped off a cliff overnight. And the result was a large amount of stock was dumped onto the market that would have been short-term rental into the long-term market. Uh, that had a resultant deflationary effect on rents as competition levels increased. Um, and for the first time in 10 years, we have actually seen a, a reduction in rent of Edinburgh. Uh, average rent's gone down by about 4.1% if you look at uh, certain um, numbers. Um, it's, to a degree, I don't have a massive, in, a massive problem with that. In fact, if you look at rents in Edinburgh over the last 10 years, I think they've gone up by something like 50%. Um, so, you know, there is an affordability issue there. And I think this type of thing is, is potentially a, a market readjustment. And it's not a bad thing. Um, property, that said, very much is still letting. Um, there is still significant demand to live in the center, in the city, sorry, I should say. Uh, and properties that are well presented, in good condition, are attracting tenants and are letting quickly. 
So we always say to our client base, you want to be best in class. Um, there has been a little bit of a move in terms of locations. Um, there was a talk, I think, when COVID first hit that we were going to see some kind of mass migration from the city centres to uh, the countryside. We, we haven't seen that in Edinburgh. There has been, a, I think, an, a, to a degree, it's limited. What we have seen is what people are now referring to as the halo effect that has been a move to relocations within the urban environment. So maybe outside of the right of the core central locations into sort of kind of slightly more tertiary locations where access to outdoor space is, is coming, becoming really important. So tenants are prioritizing what they're looking for and uh, ability to be able to work from home, access to outdoor space are now becoming, are coming higher up the list. That said, connectivity and transport links is still really important. So it's, 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 there has been a change, but not as dramatic potentially as some people have suggested. Thanks for that, Charlie. And I mean, I know that you deal with clients all around the world over in Asia and Malaysia and, 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 and other places. When you're dealing with international buyers looking at Scotland, what kind of assets, locations, is there any kind of trend that you can pick out for, for, the, uh, for the foreign buyers of places and assets that they like to buy? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, a lot of my overseas clients were at one point investing quite heavily into, into the HMO market. And uh, for, for those who don't know what that is, house in multiple occupation. So it's essentially a student style flat. Now, in Scotland, what constitutes an HMO is kind of different to what constitutes an HMO in England to a degree. England very much seems to be veered towards the, the bedsit type of um, property. In Scotland, you rent a whole property on a joint and several tenancy. So it is a group of friends living together in a flat, signing onto a lease and renting that property as a, as a group of friends. Um, there was a big demand for those style of properties because they were high yielding. We were seeing gross yields in, in excess of seven, eight, even 9%, depending on location. The impact, one of the things we have seen is in Scotland, they've changed the additional dwelling supplement uh, taxation. And I think James will probably mention that. Uh, but what it's meant is that properties at the higher values have been hit quite hard. So I'm now seeing more interest in clients buying properties at slightly lower value, but maybe buying more of them. So rather than a single purchase at five or six hundred thousand pounds, they're buying three properties at one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand pounds or something. So and that that has reduced the, the the impact of taxation at the point of purchase. Um, one other thing also we're seeing a lot more of is the impact of Section Twenty Four, particularly on domestic landlords, uh, and they're buying in company vehicles. And again, we are seeing that with overseas clients as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one other thing that overseas clients are, are very interested in at the moment um, is, is trying to generate or trying to get some form of finance, which, mm. which can be problematic. Mm. And, and for your UK clients, what, what are they looking for? What kind of assets locations do they, um, do they prefer in your experience? On the whole, most of my, my, over, sorry, most of my domestic clients tend to be focused on the one two bed market. It tends to be properties that will appeal to the young professional market. Uh, areas in, in Edinburgh that, that attract those type of um, tenants. And so we're, we're very focused on areas that are seeing inward regeneration, large scale transportation projects. Uh, the big news in Edinburgh is the extension of the tram link, um, which some people are for, others aren't. It's a bit of a political hot potato in Scotland. Um, but, you know, these type of things that are going to drive potential capital values, but also make sure that we're attracting a good demographic from a tenant viewpoint. OK, thank you. Uh, thanks, Charlie. And, um, Gemma Richardson, just from Anderson Strathern, just just to bring you in, uh, Gemma, you, you work often on the on the conveyancing side, on the property transactions, dealing with people buying residential property. Um, That's right, David. I'm a property lawyer. Terrific. So, and just picking up on um, picking up on Charlie's points on trends. I mean, what have you seen um, from your desk in terms of 
uh, the latest trends on, on transactions of residential property uh, in Scotland? Well, we have been seeing the move to the country that Charlie's described, maybe more so with our clients who are looking for family homes and those who are kind of at the mid-level of the market. So people are looking for more space and moving slightly out of town, um, particularly in areas just outside of uh, the big cities in the central belt. So we've seen the volume of sales in East Lothian, which is a county just outside of Edinburgh, um, with kind of variable commuter links, but the volume of sales there has gone up by 32.5% um, year on year. So that's um, quite remarkable. At the first time buyer end in the of the market, we've seen a dip in demand for kind of one bed flats because people are working from home. So two bed flats are doing very, very well. In fact, I offered on a property yesterday a, a nicely presented two bedroom flat um, in, in the middle of Edinburgh, which got 31 offers and went for 24% over its value. So mm. that was that was pretty surprising. Um, we have seen a dip in demand for the city centre properties, um, especially those that don't have private outdoor space and areas that would have relied more heavily on the student market have suffered quite badly. Um, but in Edinburgh, we, we do kind of have quite a resilient market um, so the home report valuation level, and I can explain a bit more about home reports later, but the, the valuation of properties has um, sort of been quite secure and properties continue to sell around their value and not much lower. So um, it's still quite resilient. Um, retirement properties aren't selling so well at the moment um, for, for okay. fair I, I saw a statistic in Knight Frank's wealth report recently saying that Middle Eastern families are, are diversifying across the UK, investing less in London and more in regional cities. And they noted Edinburgh uh, as, a, as a place. Have you seen foreign an, in, an increase in, in interest from foreign uh, investors? We've noticed a huge increase. I mean, Edinburgh is quite appealing as far as the, the prices compared to other cities uh, in the UK. It's got a lot of open green space and um, there is a lot of appeal for a foreign investor here. Um, we've got three universities um, and kind of quite strong tech and banking sectors. So um, I've noticed a lot of overseas buyers that I've been acting for uh, focusing more um, on Edinburgh recently. Very interesting. Exactly the same thing. Um, tends to be Pacific Rim. Um, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, really strong at the moment with investors um, and Australia and, and the US as well, actually. OK, terrific. I, I mean, uh, Gemma, for, for buyers who are not familiar with uh, the purchase process in Scotland, perhaps you could just give us a high level contrast between some of the features of the Scottish legal system versus buying a property um, in the rest of the UK. Absolutely. So uh, the Scottish system is a bit different. Any property that's on the open market will have a home report. Now that um, includes a survey and evaluation that a purchaser is entitled to rely upon. So we don't tend to have to go down the, the route of all the buyers getting their own surveys because there's one that's available for everybody. Um, properties are priced based on that home report valuation um, and solicitors tend to be involved far earlier in the process. So I know in England, if you're offering for a property, you'll have a state, an estate agent that's involved initially and a solicitor will take over later. But here you um, would need a solicitor to act for you in order to offer for a property. Um, so, so we are involved very early on. Um, that does mean that we can provide advice, particularly on micro markets. Um, as Charlie said, there is a fair amount of sort of regionalization in the market. So um, having good advice uh, from a solicitor quite early on on that level is important. Um, the contract process, I like to think, is a little bit more straightforward in Scotland. Um, as a group of solicitors, we sat down and agreed a set of standard terms and conditions for a residential property transaction. So most transactions proceed based on those and they're considered to be fair for both sides. So that does minimise the contractual negotiations meaning that you get to a binding contract for your deal, um, perhaps a little bit faster than elsewhere in the UK. But Thank you. I mean, Charlie, do you find your foreign buyers appreciate this sort of slightly more uh, straightforward bit of procedure? Do, you, do they comment on it? Are they aware of? 
I think the, the important thing there is is that 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 um, I always always plug this. It's worth paying for value and for knowledge and for professionalism, which is why we work closely with firms like Gemma, uh, like um, Anderson Strathairn and Gemma. So um, some some overseas buyers probably don't understand the Scottish market. I think quite a lot of my um, clients have all thought that it operates very similar to the English market, and actually there is an element of education that is required at the outset um, to say to and to explain to them the way the process operates. Um, the, the closed bid system is also obviously something that is something potentially that they haven't come across. Now, I try and secure any asset for my client either off market so we don't have to go to what in Scottish terms is known as a closing date or negotiate a deal without going to a closing date, which is where I can add significant value because I can often secure properties at significantly lower value than, than the, ten, the, uh, the landlords, the, um, excuse me, the, the client would pay for themselves. And, you know, to Gemma recently touched on a property that went 24% over value. Well, all the assets that I've bought for my clients in the last 12 months have been bought either at value just over in, or in a very limited circumstance, actually under value. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a need to understand how the market operates. And that's where working with professionals, obviously like Gemma, in terms of the purchasing process can be really advantageous. Great, thank you. And, uh, Gemma, I know you're focused on the property transaction, but in terms of broader considerations, the client might be thinking about uh, at that point, like succession planning or broader tax planning. We're gonna bring bring James in for, for a more detailed analysis on this, but what are some of the things that you, you might discuss with a client on, on the outset as to particularly, I suppose, a foreign buyer less familiar with the, with the, uh, the UK uh, le tax and legal system? I think it's really important for the buyer to be considering um, all of the elements early on. So looking at their funding, looking at their exit strategy um, and looking at their overall objectives um, and taking specialist advice from a legal advisor, perhaps more than one legal advisor with different expertise um, from the banking side of things with your mortgage and gearing, which um, Duncan will talk about, and also on the tax. So I think it's useful having a kind of quite a collaborative discussion early on to consider all of these elements so that you know you're structuring things appropriately. Um, if you are considering offering on the open market, it's quite fast paced. Mm. So getting all of this prepared early so that you're offering in an appropriate name, so if you rather a company or a trust rather than as an individual, um, that sort of thing can be very, very useful. And it's time well spent if you're considering um, making a property investment to do that right at the outset and get all of the advice so you know how it's going to be structured and also so that you can secure a property quickly and start getting income from it. Okay, thanks. And uh, James, just to bring you in, in, in on that point on, on the succession planning options, um, we're going to have a deeper dive on tax shortly, but I mean, what are the sort of headline considerations that someone buying a new property considers when they're looking at succession planning and tax? Succession succession is always quite interesting because um, a lot of time money won't change hands. I mean, we're talking a parent passing a property to uh, to a child or, or whatnot. So, unfortunately, that actually comes into play capital gains tax. Um, if it's not within a company, that's very that's slightly different, but um, if you're looking at market valuations. So if there is any tax to pay because the property's done really well right, in terms of its market value has gone up, then there might not, any be, might not be any money to actually pay the tax that's due. And so that is, is from a cash flow point of view, uh, yes, it's a huge consideration. I, unfortunately, I do get a lot of people come to me after the fact. So they've, they've tried to do something themselves. They thought this is a great idea. And unfortunately, it's already happened. There's not an awful lot of tax planning you can do retrospectively. It should be looked at previously. But the, the positive side of that is that you do usually have to get a solicitor involved if you're changing ownerships. So hopefully a solicitor would stop you before you went ahead and did something. But again, it comes down to speaking to somebody who actually knows okay. what we're talking about. Okay, well, thank you. just want to bring in uh, Duncan Buchanan uh, from Hamden & Co. A gearing and, and credit for property is obviously a key part of the mix there and, 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 and a key part of the planning, um, Duncan. It would be great to hear from you on from your side what you see as um, the current state of um, credit and availability of borrowing for
for residential property in Scotland and perhaps give us a couple of examples of some some of the deals you've been working on recently. Yeah, so I think um, banks typically in the UK at the moment are really well capitalised and keen to lend. Uh, one of the challenges that we're seeing is around offshore um, offshore buyers. It's actually quite difficult if you're offshore to even open a UK bank account, let alone borrow money. So that, that is a challenge, and it's one about making sure you have the right structure and right entity. And whilst there are providers out there, um, they are really limited. And therefore, if you're limiting your providers, you're going to probably pay over the odds to get access to it. Um, and we've seen a, an awful lot of purchases in quite a few different entities, so pensions, partnerships, trusts, and companies. Um, and I think, as, as Gemma said, the key is speaking to your professional advisors first, getting tax advice, getting legal advice, um, to make sure that the structure suits what you're planning to do. Um, and so we'll work with um, suitable professionals in a kind of round table approach to make sure that you get that right early on. And it is key to get it right really before you're bidding for a property um, and then get specialist advice for the specific area. So an example is, is a case I've been working on where a client in a limited company structure is buying a property in St Andrews. And I introduced him to um, a local solicitor because it really is an unusual market. It, it's a global market. It's different from anywhere else in Scotland. Mm. You need somebody with their ear to the ground to see how it works. Um, and then, you know, the, the structure had to be in place before the bid was made. So, again, exactly as Gemma said. Um, but, the, you know, there is lots of opportunity and borrowers are willing to lend. We're seeing loan to values across the board starting to increase again. They dipped um, on the high street. You will now get first time buyer mortgages up to 90 percent. The new government guarantee scheme is coming in up to uh, purchases up to 600,000, which isn't just for first time buyers. So I think we'll see this year um, banks continuing to fund um, and uh, a competitive marketplace, which will likely keep it, um, interest rates available quite low. And a key part of your offering is as a relationship driven, isn't it? So the size of the deals that you might look at uh, can vary, but it depends it's for the right client. You can do everything from the smaller deal to, to the larger ticket. Is that? That, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. So, so we, we kind of like to see ourselves as a family bank, family relationship bank. So, you know, I, I will lend to uh, the, the, the head of the family, typically a, a larger lend, but very often we're lending to their children, uh, whether it's with parents as guarantors or um, parents gifting money out of their, their own estates down to children or grandchildren, and they'll be far smaller facilities. And it's really just about understanding that wider family picture and planning so mm. the size of the loan to be fair is irrelevant mm. it's about providing the solution and then ideally if you've got a relationship with the parents or the grandparents you want to carry that relationship on to their children and grandchildren so you have a long-term relationship so so therefore you know ideally you're looking at every part of the transaction from buying their first flat as you know maybe a one-bedroom flat as a first-time buyer to you know, we launched a, a product last year where we're lending to retired people to free up liquid capital in large houses to get the money moving intergenerationally. Um, and that's something that we're, we're seeing more and more. Gemma, just from your perspective, uh, on the, for more retail um, mortgage inquiries, are you seeing finance being readily available? Does it cause deals to fall over? Or are you, are you seeing that, um, as, um, as Duncan was saying, you know, banks are happy to lend? And, and, and is it a constraint or not from your perspective? Well, again, it comes down to planning. Um, so usually I would be advising clients to have mortgage discussions very early on, particularly before offering. Um, having a good broker or a good contact within a bank is, is very, very helpful with that. Um, we are noticing more deals falling through because of issues with mortgage funding, but it tends to be um, issues around timing, um, mm. meaning that you've got big chains of transactions and things are turning around at quite short notice, which means that whilst one bank might not be able to lend and then you've got a chain of transactions falling through as a result, another bank probably would have lent. And so had the planning been done early on and you'd gone to the right bank to begin with, then um, the, the deal could have been salvaged. We've done quite a lot of 
parachuting lending into cases to keep things on track. So um, most people are able to get the funding that they need. Um, and it does come back to broader advice on whether you're purchasing the right property at the right time, and um, particularly if it's an individual. But um, I, I think the mortgage lending is available, but it, it's much trickier, particularly buy to let mortgage funding for the offshore client. So okay. again, the message is just specialist advice early on. Terrific. Um, Duncan, uh, when we were chatting in the in the pre-planning call for this, you were mentioning about a real observing a real change in demand for the larger properties. Some of the estates are, are, are seeing, uh, you know, terrific new interest in them. Perhaps you could explain what you're observing. We, we, uh, we, we, are, uh, we are. I mean, you know, we talked about, I, I see this as part of probably right at the end of the chain, but I see this as part of that discussion we've already had about the, the, the move out of the city mm. uh, and genuinely the country being seen suddenly as more attractive than it possibly once was, um, but also supported by the fact that there's an awful lot of money being attracted to the country with the larger estates. So this isn't just res, you know, residential, this is residential and land. And whilst I think um, for many years people would have bought a large estate they maybe bought the house and the land would go with it and then they would find ways to manage the land. It's slightly the reverse now. Um, people are wanting to buy the land and that land will come with property. So typically, uh, you know, a big house and, and cottages and we're seeing a lot of, even um, though it's been difficult through COVID, we've seen a lot of discussion around conversion of, of cottages into holiday lets and to um, bring hospitality and tourism to, to the estate. But there is um, a genuine movement into green investment. And, you know, it's, it's public knowledge that a large corporate bought two large estates, one in about August last year and one in January this year. I'm aware of other corporates and large family investment offices who have cash ready to buy large estates. Um, and that is about things like planting trees. That is about carbon capture, and it's a genuine, it's not a kind of political correct movement. I think it's a genuine now movement into that as an industry. Um, and um, I, I've been contacted by land agents really for the first time in my 20-year private banking career, saying we have people lined up if you know people who've got estates to sell. Mm. I, I've never, you know, for a number of years, it's been quite difficult to shift estates. They've been on the market, they could be on the market for two to three years. That, that is less so now. Um, there's definite attractions. It doesn't seem to be getting affected by the politics around Scotland at all. Uh, and we're seeing genuine investment coming into that space. Could be once in a lifetime opportunity to re-energise, reinvest into, into some of these um, into some of these fantastic you know, properties. But that, as you say, haven't been have been out of favour. I mean, Charlie, is that something that, that you've seen or any of the other panellists have seen uh, this this trend that Duncan's uh, picked Funnily up? Funnily enough, I've got a client at the moment who um, who owns a fairly large swathe of land and, and a big pile, not far outside of Edinburgh, actually. And he owns a number of obviously properties on the estate that they rent out uh, and they've improved them, like Duncan says. Um, he's also um, gone to uh, look for finance to purchase residential investment property in Edinburgh. Uh, he's actually bought a property. I helped him uh, consult on a property uh, recently and they're looking to add potentially three, maybe four or five into the into the into the company, as it were, it's owned by a trust. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm seeing, you know, it, it, I think it rather depends. As, as Duncan will know, there are the sort of kind of older families that are still in residency in these huge places. That that uh, and speaking from a little bit of experience here, um, there are you know costs associated with running an estate and having a large house that needs five hundred thousand pounds depending on the roof. Uh, and some of the families that own these places are not necessarily cash rich. Um, mm. There are a large quantity of people that are buying these things that are. Uh, and a lot of the places that the, the, a lot of people who buy these things are putting a lot of money into them as well. So you are seeing uh, mass improvements. Uh, I used to work on an estate in Caithness, which is about as far north as you can go. And they've built the North Coast 500, which is this, this route that everyone now knows. And on the back of that, the level of, of, of tourism in Caithness has just has, has risen dramatically. And, um, you know, 
properties that, that were sort of falling to pieces, old crofts and so on, have sprung up all along that road with, with, uh, with Airbnb. And I'm all for it. I mean, you know, having lived in the county of Caithness for eight years, I know that there's a limited amount of, 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 uh, of employment up there now that they're closing Dune Ray down. So, you know, I think it is, a, it is if it's handled well, it is a good thing. But yeah, I, I think some of these estates are also diversifying. They're looking at other mm -hmm. things. Carbon capture is something that Duncan mentioned. It's it's now a big thing, and it's not and it's not just about hugging trees. You know, it is a it's definitely a, a, an active thing that people are looking to to do now. And I think you're I think you're right, Charlie. I, th I think the investment that's going in, I think the 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 kind of lifestyle, the experience you can get in in and around um, the the lower Highlands and the Highlands of Scotland has just changed completely in the last ten to fifteen years driven predominantly from offshore money coming in, but investing in things like hospitality, far more higher end. I've got um, clients who have invested in holiday let businesses, but very high end holiday let businesses. Um, and now rather than just being a one off, he's a very nice high end boutique Airbnb, for want of a better phrase. They can now package that up as a proper experience with maybe not, you know, nine or 10 other like minded businesses to make it an all around package. Mm. Um, and we just never had that before. And that's a real sea change from the kind of tartan carpet, dowdy, pretty horrible experience of 10 or 15 years ago. I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be too cynical, um, but I would also say that's possibly driven by some of the uh, inheritance tax reliefs. Uh, I was going to say that. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, there's one thing that's there. That's what they're for. <laughs> yes. we've, we've certainly seen uh, I've dealt with a couple of families recently that who, who have bought properties for their children, uh, whether that be through gifting the money to the child directly or buying the property for the children to live in uh, and then renting out rooms within it. But certainly I've dealt with one or two families who own large estates who, who have been doing this in terms of trying to sort out the inheritance side of things. And, and you know, this is where, again, planning is so important. And it's again why we have a conversation with someone who's looking to invest at the start of the process to say, you know, have you looked at your tax position? Have you considered it carefully? And have you come up with a strategy that, that works best for you? I, I do see a lot of stuff posted out on various social media channels about, you know, is it the best way to vote? Is it the best way to invest for a company or whatever? Well, there's no right or wrong answer to that because every single person is different. And I sit there and watch these things every time and go, go and get professional advice. Because some bloke sitting in a, in a, in a, on a Friday night on his phone after having had a couple of drinks is not going to give you the best advice about your tax position on Facebook. You know, it's crazy. Well, we're going to come to James for that in a second. But first of all, we've got a question from uh, Barbara Anderson, who's tuned in on, on YouTube with us. Uh, hi there, Barbara. Um, it's a question for Gemma, just asking, um, the, the quote is, she recently had experience of a home report coming in at 150000 above a valuation provided by another surveyor. Would that cause a subsequent, would that cause an issue and for the deal to fall over down the line? Gemma, is there a view on that question? Um, it shouldn't do necessarily, I suppose. Um, when you get a home report valuation, it is, it's not an exact science um, and each surveyor is going to have their view. Some properties can be harder to value than others. If there's not direct comparables to work with and the similar properties that may have sold recently can be very difficult. And you can see some discrepancies between what one surveyor's view of value might be versus another. Um, what I say to clients when they're offering and considering a home report is you're looking at how the market has reacted to the property. So if a home report valuation um, is frankly too high, the market will react to that and the property won't get the interest that it ought to. Um, I suppose for, for Barbara's situation, I would be more than happy to have a chat um, about uh, her circumstances and the property in particular, because it does tend to be very property specific. Um, and so I, I suppose she should be considering if somebody was offering for a property where the home report valuation seemed high, uh, you would be looking at how the markets reacted to the property as well to consider whether it's an appropriate investment. And if she was going to be selling it again in six months time, whether, um, whether she would be getting her money back. 
And that's the main thing to okay. be well, I mean, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just quickly yeah. add, um, because uh, we obviously instruct valuations and we instruct home reports uh, as a lender. So just to give some kind of background mm. to it, um, when, when we're instructing a valuation or a home report, the, the, the surveyor uh, has to provide comparables. And those comparables has to be reasonable comparables uh, in line with the, the Red Book Rick's rules. Um, and as Gemma said, if you're in the country, that can be more challenging. If you're in Edinburgh, for example, that shouldn't be, and it should be relatively accurate. So a discrepancy of that size, um, it would certainly be a reddish flag for me as a purchaser or an investor to want to investigate further. Mm. Well, thank you very much for that perspective, um, Duncan and Gemma. Hope that got to your question, uh, Barbara. Um, James, so just digging into some of the tax, uh, some of the tax issues that we've kind of hinted at throughout this session. Um, one of the things I think to, to sort of take on or clear up is um, how stamp duty land tax and Scottish LBTT varies. What are the key differences for people less familiar with the local market? What should they be? What should they know about that? Okay. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. This is quite political, so I'll try and stay uh, neutral. Okay. Um, but <laughs> uh, stamp duty land tax is based in England and Northern Ireland. Uh, Scotland has land and building transactions tax, which is only in Scotland, and uh, Wales have their own, which is tra land transactions tax. They're all roughly the same uh, in terms of the way that they work, the rates and the percentages, and the, when they kick in are all slightly different. Um, I won't go through that. I don't want to bombard you with numbers as much as I'd love to. That is my style. But um, effectively, the, the main headline was that the Scottish, there, there was a, I won't call it a holiday because that's what people have been calling it. It's not actually that. The extension of the 0% ban. So basically, before you start paying, that can happen July last year in response to, to COVID-19 in order to help the, the market and encourage some purchasing. Um, that is being continued on in England and Northern Ireland, and it's basically, it's already been announced that it's stopping in Scotland. It wasn't even as generous in Scotland to begin with. Um, on top of that, you have, um, in England and Northern Ireland, you have, it's not called the additional dwelling supplement there, but it's an extra 3% if you already own another residential property anywhere else in the world. Um, and in Scotland, that same tax, which is called the additional dwelling supplement, is 4%. So obviously more expensive. Um, and this would apply to companies and trusts, non-natural persons as well. So it gets quite expensive um, purchasing mm. a property. And this is based on the purchase price. Now, the, the only thing I would really say, with, uh, because I've probably spoken enough about it, is the um, something that is slipped in under the radar, um, or at least I think, is that in England and Northern Ireland, there is a non-resident tax that is coming from the 6th of April 2021, which on top of their 3% is an extra 2%. So we don't have that in Scotland. It's not been announced yet. So in Scotland, it's 4%. And for certain people, it's going to be 5% in England and Northern Ireland. So, I mean, it, it's expensive. And this needs to be paid within 30 days of purchasing the property, which has a huge impact on what you can actually afford to buy, especially if you're getting mortgages. So it, it's, a, it's a big factor to consider. Um, and along with what's it going to cost you to purchase it, how much you're going to pay if you're getting income from it, and the exit plan, uh, capital gains tax and uh, inheritance tax. So huge, huge factors to consider. There are a lot of stamp duty reliefs available, particularly on different usage. And things. Do, do roughly those reliefs kind of mirror if people are buying certain types of property, <laughs> land buildings? They, they do, they do. I, I, to, to get, to get I, again, these get quite complicated and I don't want to get too into it, but if you bought, the, the magic number is six properties. If you bought six properties, and this is roughly the same in England and Northern Ireland as it is in Scotland, then you basically, if the transaction is deemed to be linked, and again, loads of hoops to jump through to ensure that you acquire that, you buy six properties. Let's make a typical, simple example. You buy a block of flats, six, six, six flats in it, you buy them all at the same time from the same, from the same seller. Absolutely, that's linked. Right? I don't think anyone's going to question that. Effectively, you're not buying six residential properties. You're buying six non-residential properties or a non-residential property. So this 4% doesn't apply. It really gets very, very complicated. I get involved in this, but the solicitors tend to be the ones that fill in the actual forms because they're involved in the, in the sales. So everyone has to be singing from the same hymn sheet. If you're trying to do some 
planning to make sure that it's not going to apply, you've got to make sure your solicitor knows because it's 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 uh, it's not going to be helpful if you're doing something for tax and it turns out the solicitor disagrees or or has a different opinion. So yeah, it's it's very very important to know what you're doing beforehand because it's a costly mistake. Okay, thanks. Business. And you also advise clients on residency. I imagine if you have someone who buys a property for owner occupation, a property in Edinburgh that they just like spending some some time of the year in, you advise them on their residency position so they don't act inadvertently become a UK taxpayer unless that's something they intend to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's very complicated. It's become even more complicated with COVID-19 um, because the UK system is called the statutory residency test. And a lot of people refer to it as a 90 day thing. Get rid of that. It's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. Um, it, but it is mainly to do with the number of nights you've spent in the UK over the course of the year. Now, this gets confusing because you can only really be tax resident in one country at a time, which is different from being resident. Tax residents are different. And take America, for example, where they base their residency based on citizenship. You might not have spent any nights in, in America for the entire UK tax year, which, again, is a different year from the Americans one. But you might meet the UK. So you actually have to go further than that, go within the double taxation agreement and decide which one you're more resident in. This is really specific stuff and it affects far more and more people as people become more mobile. But yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge factor. Um, and the, the implications are that, well, if you're a UK resident, your worldwide income and gains are now taxable in the UK as well mm. as the other country possibly. So it, yes, huge, huge implications of that as well. It's, they're not making it any easier. Let's put and, it that and way. If they avoid, if, if you've got an investor who is, is not occupying, but uh, doesn't become resident, doesn't spend much time here, how might, how might a foreign landlord get, get their rental position wrong or their tax disclosure wrong in general? And how might you help? I know you help people get their affairs in order. So what kind of situations do you see in this field? Well, um, this is this is uh, this is fairly common. Obviously, o lots of overseas landlords, um, HMRC, have tried their best to make it simple. If you've got, well, they failed, but they tried their best. And they, if they, if you've got a non-resident landlord, first of all, it's going to depend what country they're in, what their tax situation in the UK is. There's the personal allowance, which is your tax-free, the amount of income you can earn in the UK without paying tax in it. Where what your nationality is, where you live. Uh, and the UK's uh, relationship with that country has a huge effect on the tax you pay on the UK and also where you, tax, where you pay tax in your home country. Typically, as a general rule of thumb, if you will, if you're a UK citizen, you've got a UK passport, you're entitled to it, no matter where you are. You're entitled to this £12,500 uh, of tax-free income. But if the Britons had some kind of historical empire connection with the country, you're probably entitled to it too. Um, a good example would be Australia, if you are a national and a resident there, you're entitled to the UK personal allowance, but you have to be both. So you couldn't be Chinese national living in Australia. You'd have to be both. Americans, they're just simply not entitled to it. So it really depends. The EU Brexit's made a huge, huge difference. But in terms of the, the logistics, mm. if you've got, if you've got uh, somebody who buys property in Edinburgh and, are, and they're letting it out, then what's meant to happen is if you've got an agent... Uh, who knows what they're talking about, then effectively they will deduct 20% tax after their expenses and the expenses you've incurred before paying it to you. And therefore, you don't need to do a tax return to report the income, but you're probably overpaying tax um, for various reasons. Um, so what you can do is apply to be a member of the non-resident landlord scheme. And effectively, that stops that requirement by the letting agents having to deduct the tax, and but you're required to submit an annual tax return. Now, another problem there is that you cannot submit a, a, a tax return as a non-resident using the HMRC free software. So you either use someone like myself, which is an extra cost, or you download software, purchase commercial software that can do it. Um, so, so yeah, it, it becomes a bit more expensive. Um, but that's assuming you've done everything right and you've got yourself an agent. If you don't do that, What's meant to happen, and I've never seen this happen in practice, is that the tenant is meant to deduct 20% tax, pay that into HMRC, and then and then pay the remaining to the to the landlord. I, that simply has never happened in my view. I just don't think anyone's ever done that. So um, you don't do that, you could get yourself in trouble depending if there's any tax to pay, and you could go back 20 years and 
and basically tax penalties, interest, um, it's it gets quite bad. So yeah, getting getting it right from the get go is important. But don't bury your head in the sand, isn't it? If there is an issue, yeah. better <laughs> take it on. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go out and go out and uh, sort the issues out. Thank you for that. That's excellent. And just as we're coming towards the end of this discussion, I wanted to bring uh, Duncan back in and just sort of say, you know, we're looking at the credit picture before. It, in, in looking at the broader macro economy, is credit going to remain cheap? Is the housing market where are, you know where are we at? Are we are we? Do your economists think we're coming in for a correction? What's the what's the bigger picture? Um, what's the crystal ball got. Well, uh, I'll start my answer by kind of saying, so uh, interest rates haven't materially changed in the last 12 years. And all through that 12 year period, I've been hearing that interest rates are going to go up and they haven't um, from lots of experts. So I, th I think, therefore, if you do hear something where an expert's telling you what interest rates are going to do, I would, I would take it with a, a, a healthy dose of scepticism, really. Um, I, if you look at money markets, it looks like rates are going to stay low for the, the short to medium term. Um, as I said earlier, banks are very well funded, um, but I, I think there might be, we might start to see a difference. It's a very competitive atmosphere, therefore interest rates are very low. You look especially at retail mortgages, they're incredibly low. Even though they're harder to get, retail buy-to-let lending is still incredibly low. But banks aren't making very much money, relatively speaking. Um, and so I think it will be interesting to see how that plays out. They are all fighting for the same business, but with base rates continued to be low, it's very hard for a bank to make money. Um, so, so you can imagine there being pressure on some parts of their business to start increasing rates, maybe in the commercial book first and filtering through into a retail book, we'll see. But the underlying cost of borrowing, I think, will continue to be cheap for the foreseeable future. I can't, I can't see any real reason why. I, I, I've spoken to lots of experts over the last two or three months some are saying, well, actually, even if there is inflation, the government might be quite happy to, to keep interest rates low and have slightly higher inflation to reduce the, bor the, the borrowing book. Others mm. saying completely the opposite. So, uh, you know, as ever, it, it, you know, if you could predict what's going to happen to interest rates, you'd make a lot of money. Absolutely. But I mean, clients who are who have the ability to buy cash are incorporating element gearing because that risk of that rise, rate spiking is, is an outlier, isn't it, I think? I, I, I think it is something Charlie said earlier. I, th I think the, the people who, are ha who have had to dump Airbnb stock on the market in Edinburgh, uh, uh, I, I'm assuming a lot of those people were overgeared. Gearing mm. is a really useful thing to make, to make a good return. Um, and it's also a really good way of diversifying your, your geographical spread, the type of properties you've got, because you can buy more properties, as Charlie said. You know, mm. If you can have three properties rather than one, straight away you've reduced your risk because you've diversified. Mm. But you've got to get the level of gearing right. You can't be beholden to a bank. You don't want to be in a situation. What went against a lot of property investors back in the crash was when values dropped, because they were so highly geared, basically the bank told them to sell, and they were selling at the bottom of the market. You want to use gearing as a positive way to increase returns and diversify risk, but never to a level where you're not in control at all times. Charlie, did you have any any thoughts on that? How you see clients deploying? Yeah, that? I, I mean that that it's very interesting, and and Duncan's um, basically seeing from exactly the same hymn sheet as me. Uh, I always say to my clients, you know, a, a level of gearing is a useful thing to have. It's the oldest financial tool in the box, and it's one that at the moment I don't see any reason why you wouldn't use it. But at the same time, I think you need to be conservative, sensible, uh, well advised, and also stress test your investment. So if we're looking at, a, at a, an investment for a client, I'll normally try and stress test the, the investment up to, a, up to an interest rate of somewhere 4.5 to 5%. Uh, and if it stacks up at that, then I think there's enough uh, there's there's enough comfort there to think that that you know if, if the worst happens you're still going to be okay. I, I, I'm always a person that works on the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario, and I think that's that's you know the, the best advice that you can give a client. Um, but yeah, I mean we 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 I've got a lot of clients who who come to me and say that you know they're going to buy cash, and we have a conversation about it. Some clients want to buy cash, and that that's that's all they want to do. Others haven't really considered using any gearing. And, you know, I've got clients that have, have built significantly diversified 
uh, set of assets in Edinburgh more than they would have done, have generating a far better yield, uh, sorry, a far better return um, because they've used some gearing. Um, you know, my clients are probably geared comfortably at somewhere between 50 to 60%, 65% maybe. Uh, others are more comfortable at a higher level, but I always say the higher level you go, the more careful you need to be. Especially, especially Charlie, as we see now, a lot of buy-to-let investment, especially is in a company structure. Uh, yeah. And what people maybe forget about that is there's far less consumer protection. So it's, it's in a company structure, you, you'll have things like covenants starting to come in. You need to be advised by a solicitor to read the offer letters, yeah. but you will have things like financial covenants that you won't have in a personal buy-to-let, certainly to the same extent. Therefore, the higher up you go from an LTV, you could find yourself breaching loan-to-value covenants um, and suddenly losing power and losing control of your investment, which you don't want to do. No. Okay, thank you. Well, um, thank you to, to the panel for a fantastic discussion today. We're going